If you are preparing for an exam about computers, you will need to know the information in this video. Keep watching. What is a computer? Well, a microcomputer is a device for storing and processing data, and it uses a microprocessor. So that includes your normal computer, sometimes called a PC, personal computer, or your laptop, your notebook. Now, a smaller computer include embedded computers, and they use a microcontroller, so something with a processor inside, like a robot. Bigger, well, a mainframe computer is used by banks and airlines and universities, and it has greater processing power. The biggest is called a supercomputer. And that has the greatest amount of power and can do the most that any computer can do. That's used for weather forecasting and in modelling and in medical research, for example. What about your phone? Is that a computer? Well, it has a microprocessor inside it, so it is really a computer. It also has a digital signal processor as well that's used for sound. Inside your phone you probably have microcontrollers that are used for different parts of your phone such as a camera. What does a computer do? Well when you're asked a question you think about the question and then come up with the answer. So you process the question, you process the information. So a computer is similar we have input, it calculates what it needs to do, and then it has output. So it processes the information. Sometimes it stores it while it's processing. So we look at that, we have input, goes in, we store and process, and then it comes out as output. These lines represent passing and receiving the data and in instructions, which we can call communications. So these are the five areas that we associate computers with. The five basic operations. Input, processing, storage, communications and output. So computers are digital and use binary. True? Well yes. We think of analog as a continuous wave and we can read information from that wave the same our old tellies used to do now if you can remember they used to have problems with interference so digital can have a signal and the signal is either strong or weak a zero or a one and now we can have zero and ones as to represent information so for example using samples so in binary we can use zeros or ones and the more we use the more choice we have. So in storage we have 8 bits, 8 zero or ones make a byte. So we're looking at bytes. So about 1000 bytes, 1024 is a kilobyte, KB. 1024 kilobytes is a megabyte, NB. And 1024 megabytes is a gigabyte, GB. All use uppercase letters. A thousand bytes is a kilobyte, a million bytes is a megabyte, and a billion bytes is a gigabyte. So computers can translate into and from binary. So we can have zeros and ones and they can represent something. So for example, can represent letters such as A, B, C or D, uppercase or lowercase A, B, C or D. So that's a form of ASCII, which is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. So if you're using your computer in English with standard letters or numbers, you're probably using ASCII. If you want to use different symbols, such as characters from a different language, you could use Unicode that has much greater amount of characters. But how do computers work? Well, they use a CPU 
like a brain and that controls all the other parts. So we just need to understand the CPU. So what is a CPU? The central processing unit carries out instructions. So it has a control unit that controls the instructions and the data and it has an arithmetic logic unit which kind of does all the maths. And now the CPU is on an integrated circuit. Let's look at a definition. The microprocessor is a multi-purpose, clock-driven, register-based, digital integrated circuit that accepts binary data as input, processes it according to instructions, stored in its memory, and provides results as output. Hmm, this doesn't help really, does it? Well, that's a definition. Now let's break it down. Let's break down the definition. So we have nine different parts and we want to start with the microprocessor. So this is the central processing unit and inside the CPU we have the ALU and we have the control unit and we have data going to the main memory and the address to say where we want to put things in the main memory. So that's a guide to what the CPU looks like. So the control unit controls the instructions between the CPU and the main memory, the AOU does the maths, and we can think of the AOU putting things in registers, then moving things to the bus, and then we have the bus of the data and the addresses going to the main memory and from the main memory back to the CPU. Stored in its memory. So I said main memory, what's that? Well that's this stick you see here is called RAM, short for random access memory. And that stores the data processed by the CPU. And it has a slot, normally two or four slots on the motherboard. You can snap those uh, sticks in and it's really a list of addresses that store data. It's called random access memory. Although it accesses data in order, it can do it randomly, and that's why it's got its name. Register-based. You can see here we have this cycle, this machine cycle, where we fetch things, decode them, execute and store them. And we have this cycle going from the control unit, the ALU and the RAM. So what do they mean? Fetch gets the instructions from the user or stored instructions. We decode them to understand what to do. Execute, so the CPU execute these operations and then stores them and that leads to the output. So we have fetch, decode, execute and store. So we have this cycle, what about the timing? Well, it's clock driven. So you have a system clock that synchronizes everything, keeps everything in order. So it stops things being ready before they shouldn't be, if you like. And it's measured in gigahertz. Digital integrated circuit. Well, what does all that mean? Well. If you think about your brain, you have millions of neurons and these act as switches, zeros and ones. And that's how your brain works with these connections between these zeros and ones, if you like, on and off signals. Computers have transistors made from silicon and they act also like a switch or an amplifier, a zero or a one. So a chip can store millions of pieces of information using these zeros and ones. And now this is all integrated into a circuit. Binary data as input. So we have this binary data, these zeros and ones, and the processor can use 64 bit at a time, previously 32 bit. That's called the word size. Processing it according to instructions. Well, the CPU has its own set of instructions, so look, 
things like in and out and add and load. But an important part is cache memory. So you want to be able to access some data very quickly rather than have to wait for RAM. So this is called cache memory. You have level one is the fastest, it's not the biggest, but we have level one, level two, and possibly level three. Multi-purpose. You may have heard of dual core and quad cores. You can have multiple cores, and this allows you to do multiple processing at the same time. So you have one part, a general purpose processor, that deals with the communications between the other cores, and these other cores have a lot of power to deal with high numbers, for example. Provides results as output. So primary storage, like our RAM, is temporary. Once you switch your computer off, it's gone. It's not really stored. Secondary storage is more permanent. It's non-volatile. When you switch your computer off, it will stay on there. An example of this would be your hard drive. Is there anything else? Well, another type of computer is a server. So a server waits for requests from machines such as clients, and they ask for things, and the server gives them what they ask for. So for example, a web server will wait for a client to ask for a web page and it stores these documents and then once that web page has been requested by the client then it can send it back to the client. An alternative to the server client architecture is peer-to-peer -peer, where each computer is treated the same. So that's an alternative to the server client architecture, sometimes abbreviated to P2P, peer-to-peer. Time for some questions and answers. What is the U in ALU and CPU? That's question one. Question two. What is about a thousand bytes? About a thousand and twenty-four bytes. Question three. What type of memory can access instructions and data quickly? Question four. What type of computer is bigger than a normal personal computer, but not as big as a supercomputer. Question 5. What is the name of the connection between the CPU and the main memory, the RAM, used to move data instructions? That's question 5. Now let's look at the answers. Question 1. What is the U in ALU and CPU? Of course it's UNIT arithmetic logic unit and central processing unit. Question 2. What is a thousand bytes? Kilobyte. What type of memory can access instructions and data quickly? Cache memory. Question 4. Which computer is in between a personal computer and a supercomputer in size? It's a mainframe computer. Final question, what's the connection between a CPU that is used to move data and instructions called a bus? Okay, thank you for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. There will be some more to help you. Um, if you haven't already, please subscribe. Goodbye for now.